In my last video, I reviewed the Shulu XR1, which is a Kickstarter-backed project, and it fared pretty well, all things considered that it's got a laptop APU in it, when it came to gaming. However, I feel like there's a little bit more performance that we could squeeze out of the XR1, but the only problem is, well, we have to get a little bit hacky with it. In today's video, what I'm going to do is I'm going to be using my modified A2000 that's been shot modded and also has custom heatsink. And I'm going to be using it on the XR1 Max. And I'm going to show you guys exactly how I managed to make this happen in today's video. We have the XR1 Max itself here on the table, which is currently connected to the R3G ADT Link M.2 eGPU dock. Basically, M.2 MVME is PCIe lanes. And that can be converted over to our full-size X16 slot for PCIe. Therefore, we can use a graphics card on our M.2 NVMe slot on our motherboard. That leaves us with no slot for our operating system or storage, which is where this guy comes in. This is an external M.2 enclosure with a heatsink on it. Basically, we'll be running the entire operating system, in this case Windows, and our games from this NVMe SSD that's in an enclosure, and it's going to be plugged into a USB 3 slot on the back of the Shulu XR1. In the GPU that we'll be using with this dock is going to be my custom modified RTX A2000. You can see that it's got its own custom cooler with three fans on it. These fans are 50 millimeter Silverstone fans, the FTF 5010 model to be exact. We also have the custom heatsink, which is a giant copper block. The block has been custom milled in order to fit the A2000. And this A2000 has also been shunt modded so we can push more power into the A2000. If we take a look at the dock that's connected to the Shulu XR1 a little bit closer, and if I can get a decent close-up of the XR1, as you can see, I had to modify a few things for the XR1. I had to cut the A frame on the XR1 that basically houses the two motherboards of the XR1 and I had to cut a small piece away to make an opening for the cable for the eGPU dock. Next let's take a look at the power supply that's required in order to power the R3G ADT Link eGPU dock. And the power supply that we'll be using is from Dell and there is an abundance of these power supplies on the used market because Dell made it for an Optiplex that was pretty much dead on arrival. They sucked so bad that there is a ton of these power supplies floating around. You can pick one of these up for a really low price between $15 and $20 on eBay or Amazon. This power supply is known as the DA-2. It's capable of supplying 220 watts. On the end of the power supply, we have a rather unique but also similar looking power plug. It looks like your typical 8-pin PCIe power cable, but don't be mistaken, these are completely different. They are wired different from 8-pin PCIe power. Please do not plug this into your graphics card because it will damage it. Instead, plug it into the eGPU dock. There is a specified port specifically for this power supply on the eGPU dock, and it plugs in just like that. With everything plugged in and ready to go, I just want to mention a few quirks about the XR1 and the eGPU dock. One quirk is, is the eGPU dock has to be plugged in before you plug in the XR1. If you end up plugging the XR1 Max in first before you do the eGPU dock, for whatever reason, the XR1 Max will not recognize the eGPU and will then boot with its iGPU instead. So if you plan on replicating this setup, that I've got going on here, make sure you plug things in in the exact order that I specified or else it won't work. Another quirk is with the operating system running off the USB drive. For whatever reason, the XR1 Max is really picky on what USB port and what USB enclosure that you use for the operating system. For example, I tried the USB-C port on the front of the XR1 and the XR1 refused to post. So I ended up using a USB 3 port on the back of the XR1 instead. After trying the rear USB port, it seemed to work just fine after that. With all that out of the way, let's get into the synthetic benchmarks that we ran on the new and improved XR1. The first synthetic test that we ran is on 3D Marks Times by. With the new modifications, our overall Times by score is now 7,400 points. Our graphics score is 7,738, and the CPU score was 5,934. For the previous results, we got an overall score of 1,474 points, a graphics score of 1,307 points, and a CPU score of 5,417 points. On our previous run of Night Raid, our score was 14,219, our graphics score was 15,895, and the CPU score was 8,903. Now let's take a look at the results that we got with the eGPU modification. With the modifications, our night rate score jumped to 36,688 points, our graphics score was 86,446, and our CPU score was 8,609. From those results, as you can see, our scores jumped massively for the overall night rate score and the graphics score. Next up is Wildlife, and our Wildlife score for the previous run was 7,970 points, and the new result that we got for the eGPU dock modification was 46,385 points. Rerunning the OpenCL test on Geek 
Deathbench 6, we got a new score of 86,305 points, compared to the previous result of 16,786 that we got last time with the iGPU. Moving on to the Vulcan benchmark for Geekbench 6, with the modifications it scored 77,863 points, compared to the iGPU's previous score of 15,842 points. Those were all the synthetic benchmarks that we recorded for the modified XR1. Personally, I think it killed it on the synthetic benchmarks, but let's have a look at the gaming benchmarks. First up for the gaming benchmarks, we're going to start off with Apex Legends. This gaming benchmark graph is going to be a little bit different compared to the other ones in this video. The reason being is I could not see clearly at the 1080p resolution while using the dynamic resolution scale on Apex. Both games are running at the low preset. As you can see, the A2000 is in orange and the 5800U is in blue. For the maximum FPS, we got 145 compared to 69 FPS. The average FPS was 143 compared to 60. The minimum FPS was 125 compared to 51. The 1% 1 low was 105 compared to 45. And the 0.1% low was 75 compared to 39. As you can see, the eGPU definitely really helped in Apex Legends with using the A2000 versus the iGPU in the 5800U. And this is even running the game in a higher resolution on the A2000 versus the iGPU as well. The A2000 was running at 1080p. Meanwhile, the iGPU was running at 768p. In the next game up that we benchmark, which is actually a rather interesting result is battle bit remastered this is on the low preset on the 127 versus 127 mode the reason why i say it's a bit interesting is because the a2000 actually didn't help out very much when playing battle bit remastered i was expecting the a2000 to blow the doors off of the 5800u with the vega 8 graphics but it just didn't with that said let's have a look at the numbers the maximum fps for the a2000 was 157 compared to 133 the average fps was 110 versus 93 the minimum fps was 74 versus 76 so a little bit lower there the one percent low was 79 versus 64 and the 0.1 percent low was actually lower at 23 versus 40 on the igpu my theory for the 0.1 percent low being half of the igpu is either one of two things the first being the USB drive is actually affecting the game's performance, and two, the external GPU is only limited to four lanes of PCIe instead of 16. This kind of behavior was also evident in another gaming benchmark, which was Valorant, and I'll show you guys those results as well in this video. The next gaming benchmark we're moving into is going to be Counter-Strike Go. And once again, this benchmark tool can be found on the Steam Workshop as a custom map for CSGO. With that said, let's get into the numbers. For the maximum FPS with the A2000, it scored 469 FPS, compared to 161, which is a massive difference. The average FPS was 263 versus 111, which again is a massive difference. For the minimum FPS, it was 55 compared to 11. The 1% low was 56 compared to 11, and the 0.1% low was 49 compared to 10. So the eGPU modification here really helped out the performance with Counter-Strike GO. The key point in the benchmark where the A2000 really helped out the XR1 perform better was during the smoke tests. The 5800U with the Vega 8 graphics really struggled with the smoke in this gaming benchmark. Overall, I would say that's an absolute win for the A2000 and the eGPU modification for the XR1. The next game that we'll be benchmarking is Doom Eternal. In the previous video, I used an FSR mod for Doom Eternal, and we're going to continue using the FSR mod because it is the only upscaling technology that is available for the 5800U in the Vega 8 graphics. With that said, let's get into benchmark results. The maximum FPS for the A2000 was 238 versus 46. The average FPS was 182 versus 38. The minimum FPS was 141 versus 33. The 1% low was 124 versus 32. And the 0.1% low was 107 versus 25. And just like Apex and CSGO before it, Doom Eternal actually really benefited from the A2000 versus the 5800U and its Vega 8 graphics. With these results for Doom Eternal, you could actually probably crank the game from 1080p to 1440p and still get a really smooth and enjoyable experience. The next game up for gaming benchmarks is going to be Overwatch 2. Both the A2000 and the 5800U were using FSR. R2, because once again, the only upscaling technology available for the 5800U is FSR. With that said, let's get into the gaming benchmarks for the A2000 on the XR1. The maximum FPS was 261 compared to 99. The average FPS was 189 versus 69. The minimum FPS was 146 versus 59. The 1% low was 116 versus 41. And the 0.1% low was 83 versus 33. As you can see, the performance for Overwatch 2 using the A2000 increased quite a bit as well, but I still think the 5800U held its own quite well in terms of performance with its numbers it had previously. With that said, that's going to bring us into our second last game that we benchmark, and that was Rocket League. Rocket League was running at the low slash performance preset. With that said, let's have a look at the gaming benchmarks for the A2000 and the 5800U. So as you can see, Rocket League absolutely exploded in performance compared to the 5800U. The maximum FPS was 736 FPS versus 119. 
14. The average FPS was 477 versus 89. The minimum FPS was 337 versus 71. The 1% low was 246 versus 41. And the 0.1% low was 80 versus 27. The FPS on the A2000 is absolutely absurd. There is absolutely no reason for you to run your game at this high of a frame rate. It's actually running your hardware much harder than it normally would. So my recommendation is just to cap the game at 240 FPS and save more power and less stress on your hardware. And last but not least, the final game that we'll be benchmarking is Valorant. And Valorant was running on the low preset as well as 1080p resolution. So let's get into the numbers for Valorant. The maximum FPS for Valorant was 374 versus 205. The average FPS was 197 versus 154. The minimum FPS was 96 versus 51. The 1% low was 84 versus 47. And the 0.1% low was 5 versus 41. And as I mentioned before, just like Battlebit, Valorant showed some weird behaviors with the 0.1% low. For Valorant, however, I think I have an explanation as to why that 0.1% low was so low. After each round on Valorant, during the buy phase when you spawn back in, it for some reason kept lagging in the 0.1% low. This didn't hamper any gameplay experience at all because it was just the characters spawning in on the map. Which for me points towards a read-write issue with the external SSD that we're using for Windows and the games. Had we used another drive and separated Windows and the games from one another, I have a feeling this would probably solve those 0.1% issues with Valorant. And with that said, that's going to be all of the gaming benchmarks that we recorded on the modified version of the XR1 using the A2000. So that's going to wrap up things here with the XR1 Max using an eGPU. This mod is kind of hacky, so I wouldn't really recommend it to the average person, but if you know what you're doing, I would say absolutely go for it, because as you saw from those benchmarks, the XR1 Max can game, as long as it's got the hardware to back it like the A2000 that I used here. With that said, I'm going to wrap up things here. My name's Ken, also known as Bullchar. I hope you guys enjoyed this video on the Shilu XR1 with the eGPU. It was a ton of work trying to figure out how to get it to work. However, if you guys want to see more content like this in the near future, hit that like button and subscribe button. I'd very much appreciate it. And as always, I will see you guys in the next video. Take care.